right, welcome back to Landlord Law TV. My name is Ben Reeve Lewis, Tessa Shepperson. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the pig's ear of a law on deposit protection that came in eight years ago and so far, several times, has fallen apart faster than a lump of candy floss in a forsake gale. Absolutely. It's challenged in the High Courts. Um, we're going to kick off the story this week with the, uh, a query from Martin of Doncaster, mm -hmm. who's run into trouble with it yet again. Uh, my tenant paid a deposit of £500 when she moved into the property in April 2011. Pay attention to the dates here, which we forgot to pay, protect. We did write to her and offered to refund it, but she never replied. However, we then protected the deposit during the amnesty period given by the government earlier in 2015. Now, we've now served a section 21 on the tenant, but she's told us that she's been advised by her lawyer that the notice is invalid as we didn't protect the deposit. Now, Martin says, surely this must be wrong, is it? No, it's not. Sorry, Martin. Um, there was an amnesty period given by the government early in 2015, but I'm afraid it didn't apply to your situation. Um, the amnesty period given by the government was for the situation which was covered by the super strike case, which I expect a lot of people will remember. And that was where the, depo cause the tenancy deposit regulations came into force in April 2007. And when people um, had taken the deposit before uh, 2007, the general understanding was that unless they'd given a new tenancy agreement after 2007, they didn't have to protect the deposit. That was the gen. We all believe that. But Superstrike came along and changed that and said, well, if they, if they took the deposit before to April 2007 and then the tenancy became periodic after that date, then they should have protected the deposit at that time. So thousands of landlords were caught. Thousands of landlords, well, not the ones where the tenants have left, yeah, yeah, but yeah. there were still a lot of landlords who were still in that position. And what the amnesty for was for landlords in that situation. They were given an opportunity to protect the deposit, serve the prescribed information, and then they were okay. Now, there was a time when you could have protected your position, and this was in the first set of amendments, which came in in the Localism Act 2011. Um, now, at that stage, there was a, a, an amnesty period leading up to the 6th of May, um, 2012. Now, if you protected the deposit then, you'd have been all right, because that, that would have covered you. But the amnesty period in 2015 didn't, so I'm sorry about that. And a lot of people have, have had a misunderstanding about that and thought that it applied to them when, when it didn't. So I'm afraid um, the deposit um, is, wasn't protected at the proper time. You haven't complied with the regulations. Now, if you're, if you're a landlord and you haven't protected the deposit properly and you want to serve a Section 21 notice, um, there, there are um, procedures that you have to follow to, to enable you to do that. Firstly, if the tenant has brought a claim against you for the penalty and that's been resolved either by the judge making an order or by it being settled, then you know, you're sort of let off the hook, you know, you've, you've sort of paid your medicine and you're allowed to serve a Section 21 notice. Other than that, the only way you can serve a Section 21 notice if you haven't protected the deposit is to return the deposit money. Um, even now, if, sorry, even if the tenant owes you rent? Even if the tenant owes you rent. And um, what the statute said is that um, you can offset it, but only with the tenant's consent. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I mean, if the tenant agrees to that, it's really, really important that you get it in writing because if the tenant says, oh, okay, I don't mind you offsetting the rent, and you do that and you serve the Section 21 notice, you can bet your bottom dollar that when you issue proceedings, they'll turn around and say, I never agreed to that. If you haven't got it in writing, where's your proof? So it's really important that if you do that, you, you get a, a letter from them um, in advance, signed, saying that they're happy with that. Mm. But um, apart from that, you, you, need to, you need to refund it. Now, there has been a case recently, Kuja and Chowdhury, um, where this sort of situation arose, the landlord said, well, I'll offer to re 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 refund it, the tenant didn't accept it. And the judge said, well, you know, the tenant didn't have proper advice at the time. That's not sufficient, just, just offering to do it and the tenant not accepting it. That is not sufficient to satisfy the requirements of the Act. Um, I, I mean, if he'd, if he'd sent a cheque and the tenant perhaps had sent it back, that, that might be okay. Although I have to say the best situation is we had um, a post on the Landlord Law blog about a year or so ago. A uh, tenant wrote in and said, uh, my landlady hadn't protected um, the, the, the deposit. Um, but then the other night she came round with the police and she put the deposit in cash in an envelope through the letterbox. 
um, what, witnessed by a police officer um, and then served a Section 21 notice on us. And we all thought, well, you know, probably she has complied with that because you, you can't deny that she's refunded the money. It's belt and braces. It's very belt and braces, <laughs> yes. So, I mean, if you've, if you've got a tenant and you're worried they're going to deny it, that's, that's sort of perhaps one sort of thing that you can do. So, um, yeah, so um, it looks like you, you are in difficulties, Martin, and I suspect that um, you, you will have to um, refund the money properly and, and then we served your Section 21 notice. With the, the new legislation, there's uh, another element of it, isn't it, that yeah. came off the back of a case called Charal Ambus versus Ong, which affects all deposits now, doesn't it? That's right. I mean, the situation now is if you've, if you've taken a deposit, it doesn't matter when the tenant gave it to you, you've got to protect it before you serve your Section 21 notice. So if you've got a situation where, you, where the tenant paid it before April 2007 and the, the tenancy went periodic before April 2007, if you haven't protected the deposit, you haven't done anything wrong, that, you know, so the tenant can't bring a claim against you for the penalty or anything because you, you've done nothing wrong at all and you can carry on forever not protecting the deposit. But if you want to serve a Section 21 notice, it's a prerequisite. You've got to protect the deposit first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need to do that. So, so theoretically, oh, there won't be many of these around, but you could have moved in in 1989 and still be there. And if you pay the deposit, then it's got to be protected. And you might have had two or three changes of landlord in that time. Yes. And then, of course, at, at, at that stage, there's also the question is really, is it really an assured shorthold tenancy at all? Tenancy. Because so yeah. I don't know whether we really want to go into no, that because no, we'll be here for hours. No, not the old 20 thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, sure. um, yeah. So um, if they've paid a deposit, it's got to be protected. Um, the other situation which, because um, these, these amendments, recent amendments came in the Deregulation Act 2015, um, there was another situation which was covered, which was where a landlord uh, took a deposit after April 2007 and, and didn't protect it properly, um, uh, or, or had protected it, sorry, where they had protected and the tenancy had run on as a periodic. Now, the Superstrike case said that every time the tenancy changed into a periodic, you needed to reserve the prescribed information. And that caused a lot of problems because landlords thought that they'd done everything properly, which indeed they had, and then they found that they had to keep reserving the prescribed information um, when the tenancy yeah. ran on as a periodic. Now, you don't have to worry about that anymore, landlords, because that problem has been fixed by the Deregulation Act, and you only need to do For it now. once. <laughs> You only need to do it. You only need to do it once, and it also backdated as well. So um, that applies to um, deposits that were taken a while ago. So that that problem has now been resolved. Um, but I have to say, isn't it isn't it pathetic that a piece of legislation that's that's to benefit consumers, tenants, has been so complicated that it's taken two amendments yeah. to bring it into shape. I mean, yeah. the, the, the legislation is so complicated now. I mean, you need to have flowcharts and things to help you understand it. Yeah. I mean, it's not something anybody who wasn't legally trained could understand. And even if you are legally trained, you probably have to put an ice pack on your head, close the door and sit there for about oh. a fortnight trying to work it out. Well, I mean, I've followed the, the path of the whole thing over the last years. And when the deregulation that brought the changes in, I had to read it God knows how many times. I know. And I know it's only for now it's going to fall apart again. <laughs> I mean, you know, if the government had tried to make it complicated yeah. and difficult, they couldn't really have yeah, exactly. made a better job of it. Yeah. It really has been a complete dog's dinner. Yes. And I think one thing that landlords need to be aware of is in, in homelessness units around the country, um, most of the staff focus on what they call homelessness prevention. Now, you have specialist homelessness prevention officers. And one of the ways you can prevent homelessness is by saying someone isn't threatened with homelessness because their Section 21 is invalid. Now, what they'd be doing, and I know they're going to be doing this because I've been training them to do it, <laughs> is to look for things like this. And also the income in the other element of the Deregulation Act, which is talking about EPCs and a whole range of other things. And I think I counted about nine different ways now that your Section 21 can be invalid. Yeah, um, we'll so be talking really about those in we'll another program. We'll be coming back to them in another one, yeah. Yeah, we'll be talking but, about um, those in another program. This is just the, the latest thing on deposit protection. and I mean, I don't... 
I remember as a kid, there used to be these public information films that the government used to do. Yes. And they used to be on. I still, when I walk around in the country, I'm still obsessed with making sure that I don't leave a country gate slightly ajar. Um, and I, I park a car thanks to an old video of Reginald Mole Husband who used to reverse into the place. Um, there was the RNLI adverts, wasn't there, about is he waving or drowning and how to call the Coast Guard. How to cross the road. <laughs> look right, look left, look right again. Yeah, yeah. And if it's all clear, walk straight across. I remember yeah, that. You exactly. learned it off by heart. And we've never been run over we never well no i haven't been run over but what we're going to say is that there ought to be training about this because yeah. this is an important topic tenancy deposit regulation yep. there is very little training you know a lot of people don't know about it there's not a lot of publicity about it and personally i think they ought to teach it in schools and do you know anyone who trains stuff on section 21 well we can talk about that later but we're being told to shut up over there so i think we've reached our time <laughs> got the wind up finger well thanks for joining us again um we'll be seeing week, you again we will be seeing you again and next time we're going to be talking again about something completely different that's right so we'll look forward to that <laughs>
from a tenant who'd been provided with homeless accommodation. So they, were, they didn't have any security of tenure. And the, uh, the, other, the tenant was arguing that uh, the Section 11 of the Children Act 2004, which requires local authorities to treat the best interests of children as a primary consideration, that that effectively trumped uh, the landlord's right to possession right, yeah. and the Court of Appeal, which beneficial to my client, found in favour of us and so, so that, that's very interesting. I've also been involved in a case which looked at when Article 8 defences could be run by, by a trespasser who, who'd entered into um, accommodation as a trespass. He tried to defend his, the claim on the basis that it would breach his Article 8 rights. That's human and, rights. Yes, it? human rights uh, and the Court of Appeal said that uh, he, he couldn't use his Article 8 rights to trump the landlord's right to possession. So that was a good result as well. Um, but yeah, I, I deal with disrepair, you know, looking at whether Section 21 notice have been invalidated, tenancy deposit stuff. Mm -hmm. The whole range is, is what we deal with here and what I deal with. OK, you also, I understand, do quite a bit of training and writing. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, that's something I particularly enjoy. Um, the training. I, I, I really enjoy partly because um, not only does it mean that you have to really be up to speed yes. with the topics you're involved with, which I think makes you a better lawyer generally, yeah. but also I really enjoy um, speaking to, say, 20, 30 keen and enthusiastic people who are working within housing who want to know more. And often you can bounce ideas around and, and get really good discussions going. And, and mm. often I leave training sessions having learned something. People come up with a a scenario that you've never thought of and you have to provide the answer and I find it very satisfying. And writing as well, albeit you don't have that direct response, um, again it, it, it ensures that you really get up to speed with, yeah. with the subject and it means that you, you know it basically and, and so that's something I, I enjoy doing as well. So so what books and, and have you been, because I think you edit one of the encyclopedias do you? Or? Yes, well I, I'm a co-authored two books uh, which mm -hmm. are published by the Legal Action Group. One's called the Housing Law Casebook mm -hmm. uh, which has, we'd hope, every case that is relevant to housing lawyers although there's probably a caveat to that, <laughs> there's sure there some we haven't got but we'd like to think that every case of the housing lawyer mm -hmm. needs is in there and also quiet enjoyment which is a f essentially concerns uh, unlawful eviction and yeah. the circumstances in which landlords can remove tenants without a court or more often the circumstances they can't yeah. and the, the damages that the landlords may have to pay if they do unlawfully evict tenants. Um, I, I do also edit or uh, contribute to some books on mm -hmm. the local government encyclopedia and local government finance which aren't really to do with housing so much. So um, why do you think training is particularly important for housing work and, and what are the dangers for landlords and agents and anyone in housing if, if they don't um, keep up to date? Well, I'd say training is vitally important. Uh, housing law is quite difficult because it's quite pernickety. There's lots of I's to dot, there's lots of mm. T's to cross. And if, you, if a private landlord, for example, does all of those things, it's actually relatively straightforward because the law, certainly with a short, short old tenancy, is, is, is quite weighted in favour of the landlord, provided they do everything that they're meant yeah. to. The, the difficulties arise when they, they don't, don't do everything which they're meant to. And, and if, if a landlord or an agent is, is, is up to date, they've, taken, they've got good training and, and they know where the pitfalls are, they know yeah. what other landlords difficult what difficulties other landlords have yeah. experienced, then they're available uh, sorry, that then they're able to avoid those pitfalls. Uh, and it basically means that they can run their business or their portfolio in a much more efficient mm. way and essentially it means that they don't end up making costly mistakes. Yes, yes. So um, finally, do you have any um, predictions for the future development of housing and um, advice for people working in housing? Yes, and I, I suppose one of the, the unfortunate things for my prediction for those who, who are private landlords is I think there's going to be more regulation coming yeah. through. Uh, and, and not just that, it, certainly there's just recently been a technical discussion paper yes. that's been released by a Department for Communities and Local Government. Mm in which not only are they envisaging more regulation but also increasing the penalties yes. and also the dreaded rent repayment order which can be very expensive incredibly indeed. expensive and yeah. uh, the landlords that haven't licensed properties in Newham for example 
are facing very large rent repayment orders, yeah. which is essentially can be all of the rent for the past 12 months. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think there's going to be more of that for, mm. for landlords. Uh, in Only the, in bad landlords, yeah, of course. Well, no, it, it, yes, of course. But uh, it's you can sometimes, if you, you can be a bad landlord without not always knowing you're being a bad yes. landlord. And it goes back to training, yes. essentially. It, it's, you might not know that you need a license. Um, yeah. And there's, that's not, it doesn't mean you're a bad landlord, it just means you haven't read the Act and you're not up to date. Um, and that can result in rent repayment orders. Um, in the social sector, in the, in the socially rented sector, uh, the biggest change that's coming, which we still don't know if it will happen, is the right to buy, the extended right to buy for housing associations. Yes. Which, um, albeit although housing associations are likely to be compensated, so they're not actually going to lose any money from those sales, the real worry is that it's going to affect on the funding model for lots of associations because yes. lots borrow against their stock and if their stock is depleting yes. there are real concerns of that. And likewise the way that this is going to be funded is that local authorities are going to have to sell off their own stock yes. uh, to, to fund it and so it might be that some local authorities have much less stock than, uh, than they do now. So that might happen, we're not, not sure yet but it looks likely as it was a uh, manifesto pledge. Okay. So what's your advice for landlords and letting agents and housing advice workers and social housing workers? Well, my advice would always be to make sure that you do have regular training, not, not all, all the time obviously, but just make sure you get up to date um, and make use of all of the free online resources that there are. There are lots yeah. of very good blogs, I'll let you plug yours. <laughs> uh, well, the Nearly Legal blog yeah, as well. Yeah, the as Nearly well Legal blog, yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, and uh, th those sorts of things, you don't have to pay for them. You can simply read them yeah. and, and there's a wealth of information out there, out there for free. And if you keep abreast of that, then you're, if you're a, a landlord, you shouldn't be going wrong. And if you're advising tenants, and likewise, you're able to point out where landlords have gone wrong. Okay. Well, Sam, thank you very much for talking to me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs>
quite a large increase. If you want to respond to the consultation, the consultation period will end on the 30th of September. So although things appear to be quiet, there's a lot happening behind the scenes, much of which will probably be announced fairly soon. These developments are all going to impact on landlords and letting agents and what they can do. So you should take steps to ensure that you know what's going on so you don't get caught out. Easy Law Training is putting on a number of training events to help with this. For example, Sam Madge Wild is running an update workshop for us and, at the time of recording, we do still have a few places available. Ben and I are planning a webinar series and more information about this will be available later. You will also find a lot of information on the Landlord Law blog and on the other free industry information sites such as the Nearly Legal blog and Property Tribes. This is a very interesting time for all involved in both the private and the public rented sectors and it's important that you keep yourself informed. That's all for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you again next time. <music> <laughs>